1 Kings chapter 12. The message this morning is entitled, The Kingdom is Divided. Boy, that sounds like it came out of the newspaper of today, doesn't it? The kingdom is divided. We live in a divided country, don't we? Politically, anyway. But spiritually, too, in a lot of ways. It's amazing to me when you open the Bible, and we're those of you that are with us regularly, you know we're just going through the Bible, uh, and we're, we happen to be in this place today in 1 Kings chapter 12. But it's amazing to me how the Holy Spirit kind of arranges it so that we happen to be in a place that is very uh, pertinent and very applicable to where we are today. And I think as we go through this story, if you allow the Holy Spirit to speak to you, you'll see, wow, there's a lot here uh, that, that applies to our circumstance here in the United States today. Psalm 133 verse one says, behold how good and how pleasant it is for the brethren to dwell together in unity. God wants unity. That's a good thing. It's a good thing in our nation if we could all be united and behind uh, 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 godly principles and things like that. But you want to know something? There's no unity with the devil. You can't have unity with the devil. God doesn't want that. Uh, there's a war going on if you don't realize it. It's a, it's a war between God and Satan and his forces uh, 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 or God against Satan and his forces. We're on God's side. So we can't have unity with the devil. But for brethren to dwell together in unity is a good thing. That's what God wants. He doesn't want the churches fighting with each other, Christians fighting with each other. You see, the kingdom of Israel at the time of 1 Kings chapter 12 um, was making a transition. You see, the nation of Israel had been at the height of its glory under King David and his son Solomon. It took a long time for the nation to reach the zenith of its power and influence. But David died, Solomon died, and now the next king is going to come on the scene, Solomon's son, whose name was Rehoboam. And when Rehoboam comes in, a very rapid national decline begins. The roller coaster reached the top with Solomon, and now it's coming down. And it always comes down faster than it goes up. Now, the decline was initiated by the dividing of the kingdom into two nations, the north and the south. The north was called Israel. The south was called Judah. This division greatly weakened the nation of Israel and it never again regained the power and glory that it had under David and Solomon. So we'll begin reading in verse 1, 1 Kings chapter 12, verse 1. And here's what we read. And Rehoboam went to Shechem, for all Israel were come to Shechem to make him king. And it came to pass when Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who was yet in Egypt, heard of it, for he was fled from the presence of King Solomon, and Jeroboam dwelt in Egypt, that they sent and called him. And Jeroboam and all the congregation of Israel came and spake unto Rehoboam, saying, Thy father made our yoke grievous. Now, therefore, make thou the grievous service of thy father and his heavy yoke, which he hath put on us, lighter, and we will serve thee. And he said unto them, Depart ye for three days, and then come again to me. And the people departed. And King Rehoboam consulted with the old men that stood before Solomon his father while he yet lived, and said, How do you advise that I may answer this people? And they spake unto him, saying, If thou wilt be a servant unto this people this day, and wilt serve them, and answer them, and speak good words to them, then they will be thy servants forever. But he forsook the counsel of the old men, which they had given him, and consulted with the young men that were grown up with him, which stood before him. And he said unto them, What counsel give ye that we may answer this people, who have spoken to me, saying, Make the yoke which my, thy father did put upon us lighter. 
And the young men that were grown up with him spake unto him, saying, Thus shalt thou speak unto this people that spake unto thee, saying, Thy father made our yoke heavy, but make thou it lighter unto us. Thus shalt thou say unto them, My little finger shall be thicker than my father's wounds. And now, whereas my father did laid you with a heavy yoke, I will add to your yoke. My father has chastened, uh, chastised you with whips, but I'll chastise you with scorpions. So Jeroboam and all the people came to Rehoboam the third day, as the king had appointed, saying, Come to me again the third day. And the king answered the people roughly and forsook the old men's counsel that they gave him and spake to them after the counsel of the young men, saying, My father made your yoke heavy, and I will add to your yoke. My father also chastised you with whips, but I'll chastise you with scorpions. Wherefore the king hearkened not unto the people, for the cause was from the Lord, that he might perform his saying, which the Lord spake by Ahijah the Shilonite unto Jeroboam the son of Nebat. Well, Father, we thank you for your word. We ask you to guide our hearts and minds now as we study it, I pray in Jesus' name, amen. Do you remember how many wives Solomon had? 700 and 300 concubines. That's, that's a thousand women. And yet we only read of one son. Isn't that amazing? There was only one son that we read of that he had to bear his name after him. And that son was a very foolish, probably spoiled rotten kid, don't you think? Hosea 4.10 says, For they shall eat and not have enough. They shall commit whoredom and shall not increase because they've left off to take the heed of the Lord. <laughs> Those who commit whoredoms, and don't give Solomon excuses. He's got a thousand women, but he doesn't increase. I got one woman. I got 32 grandchildren now. The Lord blesses you when you walk in his ways. Sin is a bad way of building up a family, don't you think? With all these women, one would have expected that Solomon would have a very large number of children, but no mention of that is made. Evidently, the one who was called the wisest of men had few children. And the one son that we do know about didn't inherit his father's wisdom. Rehoboam was not really worthy of his father's throne. This teaches us something. Neither wisdom nor grace runs in the blood. <clears throat> Rehoboam came to the throne not as a young boy. He was 40 years old when he became the king. That's old enough, don't you think, that he should have had at least some wisdom. But apparently he didn't. I don't know if I'm reading into the text here, but it seems to me that he was most likely a very spoiled child. <laughs> Indulged. Wisdom doesn't come by age. You can have a, a young child that's a very wise young child. You can have an old man who's an old fool. Wisdom doesn't come by age. And it doesn't come by the number of years of education either. There's a whole lot of silly, foolish people with degrees hanging on their walls. No, wisdom comes from the Lord. That's where it comes from. Read the book of Proverbs and you'll see. It's the Lord that gives wisdom. Rehoboam didn't have any or didn't have much anyway. Solomon's court was undoubtedly a, a meeting place of the most learned men of the day. All of the academics, all of the smart guys, the scientists, the politicians, they would have all come to Solomon's court. And Rehoboam would have rubbed shoulders with these notable people. And yet, this little darling, I'm supposing, of the court didn't seem to have much of that wisdom and uh, intelligence rub off on him. None of the advantages that he had as a child in the uh, palace there 
were sufficient to make him a wise man. And on the death of his father, he is immediately proclaimed king. Now the people want to have a treaty with him, those of the northern uh, 10 tribes. You remember, he's ruling in Judah, and uh, Judah and Benjamin are fine with this king, but the other 10, they don't particularly know if they want this guy ruling over them. So the people want a treaty with him, and they request a meeting, and so he meets with them. Now the initial plan of the people was to make him their king at the meeting, but under certain circumstances. But God had a different plan. His plan was to diminish the throne and the power of Rehoboam. But they didn't know that at the time. Rehoboam probably did know of the prophetic threat from God's prophet who had spoken to Jeroboam. He probably knew of that. Solomon knew of it. And uh, the prophetic warning was that the kingdom would be ripped from Rehoboam. So perhaps he agreed to meet with the people to prevent that prophecy from coming true. That's kind of a dumb thing to do, isn't it? <laughs> I'm going to, I'm going to, I know God's going to do something, but I'm going to try to uh, 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 interfere with God's plans. No. So he comes to this meeting with the people and what happens is amazing. His behavior in this meeting was the worst thing that he could have done to advance the interests of the kingdom and maintaining particularly the combined kingdom. He did the exact thing he shouldn't do. So he only had himself to blame because it was his own foolish actions that hastened and deepened the civil division. Now, before we talk about the advice that's given by the old men and the advice that's given by the young men, notice should be taken that the people complained about Rehoboam's father's reign. Their complaints were rather groundless. We don't read of Solomon being harsh to them. Um, they could have complained about Solomon's idolatry and his many wives and his rebellion against God, but that's not what they do. <clears throat> Leading the nation into idolatry was the worst thing that Solomon did. They should have mentioned that. But that was not their complaint. Their complaint was financial and the burden that was put on them. You know what? Never did a people live more at ease than they did under Solomon. Hello. Look at the last four years in America. We were heading down the tubes economically. They didn't have anything to complain about with Solomon. Under him, they lived in prosperity. They were surrounded by, surrounded by great plenty. The taxes that they paid to Solomon advanced the strength and the magnificence of their kingdom. It was kind of like, not MAGA, it was make Israel great again. It was MIGA. <laughs> and what they did under Solomon was just advance the kingdom and it benefited themselves. And you know what? Solomon led the people into a series of building projects, but never into a war. Does that sound familiar? No wars. We just had the first president ever in the last hundred years that didn't lead us into a war. His buildings cost them money. Solomon's buildings did. But they didn't cost blood. Now, even the best of people and governments can't insulate themselves from criticism and from reproach, for that matter. You know who Winston Churchill was, right? He was the leader of Britain during World War II. The old bulldog. Um, it can be argued that he saved England from being run over by Hitler. You know, after leading the English to victory in World War II, Winston Churchill was voted out of office the next election. <laughs> Thank you very much, Winston. Bye. 
And do you even know who took over his place? I don't. Because it was a failed administration that followed Churchill. It was a socialist administration that followed Churchill. This applies. After defeating ISIS, do you remember what a problem ISIS was four years ago? They were going to take over everything. In short order, Trump defeated ISIS. He rebuilt a broken economy. He advanced America's national defense capability. He secured our borders and was working to make them even more secure. He brought historic peace to the Middle East. And then he's voted out of office, albeit through fraud. Do you know this world is filled with natural born complainers? who because of jealousy and a lust for power are eager to destroy anyone who stands in their way. And that's what's happening here in our country now. We read of nothing in Solomon's administration that would make the people's yoke grievous unless perhaps the thousand wicked women that he had married were oppressing the people behind his back, but we don't read of that either. Now Rehoboam was wise to, to consult his counselors concerning the answer he should give his people. The wise old experienced men advised him to give a kind and soft answer to his subjects. That was the right way to do it. A reconciling attitude. Even though the, the, the people were complaining about something they shouldn't have complained about, Solomon wasn't a bad guy. But a soft answer was called for here. But the foolish young men and women like AOC advised him to give a threatening response to the people's demands. Rehoboam didn't listen to the old men, the wise counselor's advice. Instead, he went, the advice, went with the advice of the young hotheads. And he followed them. And it was disastrous. Those who put their trust in the advice of wicked fools are marked for ruin. Now it's hard to imagine Rehoboam doing anything more foolish than what he did at that meeting. But that's not new for politicians. <laughs> he should have defended his father's reputation rather than giving in to the crowd's mix, mischaracterization of him. Did, did Rehoboam actually think that he himself was better to, able to rule, better than Solomon? <laughs> did he think that? What colossal arrogance. This man was blinded by pride, which was fatal for the nation's unity. And God's plans were fulfilled in Rehoboam's actions. The Lord had his hand in it. He let this young fool persist in his folly. And God hid from his eyes the things that would have led to peace. And the kingdom of Israel was ripped away from Rehoboam by the will, purposes, and power of God because of the young king's folly. God will accomplish his own wise and righteous purposes. And sometimes he uses the folly and the iniquity of sinful men to do it. You know, those who ultimately lose the kingdom of God are those who throw it away, as Rehoboam did, through pride and willful folly. Verse 16, so when all of Israel saw that the king hearkened not unto them, the people answered the king, saying, what portion have we in David? Neither have we inheritance in the son of Jesse. To your tents, O Israel, now see to thine own house, David, for Israel departed into their tents. But as for the children of Israel, which dwelt in the cities of Judah, Rehoboam reigned over them. Then King Rehoboam sent Adoram, who was over the tribute, and all Israel stoned him with stones that he died. Therefore, King Rehoboam made speed to get, up, <clears throat> get him up to his chariot to flee to Jerusalem. So Israel rebelled against the house of David this day, unto this day. And it came to pass when all Israel heard that Jeroboam was come again, that they sent and called him unto the congregation and made him king over all Israel. There was none that followed the house of David, but the tribe of Judah only. 
And when Rehoboam was come to Jerusalem, he assembled all the house of Judah with the tribe of Benjamin, 104 score thousand chosen men, which were warriors, to fight against the house of Israel, to bring the kingdom again to Rehoboam, the son of Solomon. But the word of God came unto Shemaiah, the man of God, saying, Speak unto Rehoboam, the son of Solomon, king of Judah, and unto all the house of Judah and Benjamin, and to the remnant of the people, saying, Thus saith the Lord, You shall not go up, nor fight against your brethren, the children of Israel. Return every man to his house, for this thing is from me. They hearkened therefore to the word of the Lord, and returned to depart according to the word of the Lord. Well, the people of Israel highly resented Rehoboam's wicked response. And the 10 northern tribes quickly decided to ignore the new king and return to their houses. Perhaps if they would have stayed and had more patience, they might have been able to make an acceptable settlement with Rehoboam. They would have needed to give the negotiations more time. But no, they were mad, they were impatient, and they quit. And they just walked and went home. The people of Israel were willing to be ruled, but not ridden. His threatenings of increasing their birth, increasing all of that, it's like, we don't want anything to do with this. And so they walked away. And no wonder. When a government turns away from advancing the well-being of their own people, is it surprising when the people reject that government? No, I don't think so. In effect, the northern tribes were saying, well, they have set up a king for themselves in Jerusalem. Well, let them have him. He's not our king. We'll have nothing to do with him. And the rebellion grew. Now, I know there are people that are saying things like that today. They said that four years ago. The Democrats did. Trump's not our president. (laughs) Why are they surprised when they hear that same kind of thing today? Well, to make things worse, the first thing Rehoboam did in response to the people's withdrawal was to try to increase taxes. (laughs) He sends the tax man. Having foolishly thrown himself into the quicksand, now Rehoboam sinks even further by his foolish efforts to wiggle out of this problem. The very sight of the king's tax man sends the people into a rage. They're so angry that they kill the poor man. And then they chase Rehoboam all the way back to Jerusalem. Evidently, he went with the tax man to pick up the money. How foolish. Now Rehoboam gets back home, and you have to keep in mind, he owns the army. He, he's got all the swords, he's got all the everything, he owns it. And, and uh, the northern tribes, they weren't organized in any way. They were the, they were the, the backwoodsmen, you know. They were the, not the sophisticated city dwellers. And they didn't have access to all of the... Uh, Weaponry. So when Rehoboam gets back, he tries to gather his army together. Now that was a brave thing of Rehoboam to do, to try to gather his forces. But you're going to attack the northern tribes? You're going to attack your own brethren? This is called civil war. You're, you're going to do this? You're going to go from foolish to dumb to stupid, you know? This is really bad. He wanted to try to recover what he had lost, but God stopped him from using the sword. God brought a prophet who explained to Rehoboam that that what was done was of God. And Rehoboam must accept the new reality. And then... A little bit of wisdom comes in. And he accepted the word of the prophet of God and he put down his arms. He would not oppose God in the matter. He would not go up and fight to try to kill his brethren. 
Proceeding to war would not only mean that the people of Judah and Benjamin would be fighting against their own brethren, whom they ought to love, but they would also be fighting against their own God, to whom they ought to submit. And Rehoboam and his people hearkened to the word of the Lord, disbanded the army, and left off thinking of war, which was a good thing. You know, when we know God's mind on an issue, we are wise to just submit to it, no matter how bad it makes us feel. At this time, Rehoboam felt bad. And he had the upper hand. He had all the advantages on his side. He had the army. He had the money. And yet he knew that he could not prosper if he fought against God. He knew it was better for him to live in peace with the rebels than to rise up against them and falling. Verse 25, Then Jeroboam built Shechem in Mount Ephraim and dwelt therein, and went out from thence and built Penuel. And Jeroboam said in his heart, Now shall the kingdom return to the house of David. If this people go up to do sacrifice in the house of the Lord at Jerusalem, then shall the heart of this people turn against uh, again unto their Lord, even unto Rehoboam, king of Judah. And they shall kill me and go again to Rehoboam, king of Judah. Whereupon the king took counsel and made two gold calves, or calves of gold, and sent unto them, It is too much for you to go up to Jerusalem. Behold thy gods, O Israel, which have brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. And he set the one in Bethel, and the other he put in Dan. And this thing became a sin, for the people went to worship before the one, even unto Dan. And he made a house of high places. And he made priests of the lowest of the people, which were not of the sons of Levi. And Jeroboam ordained a feast in the eighth month, on the fifteenth day of the month, like unto the feast that is in Judah. And he offered upon the altar. So did he in Bethel, sacrificing unto the calves that he had made. And he placed in Bethel the priests of the high places which he had made. So he offered upon the altar which he had made in Bethel the fifteenth day of the eighth month, even in the month which he had devised of his own heart and ordained a feast unto the children of Israel. And he offered upon the altar and burnt incense. This is terrible. Neither sides look very good here, do they? The south and the north. As a child, I was always interested in that their names seem so similar. Rehoboam, Jeroboam, Jeroboam, Rehoboam. They're both kind of equally foolish in their own ways. Jeroboam began his reign in the north building fortresses. That's a good idea. First in Shechem, then in Penuel. He probably built a palace for himself in each of those places too. A dwelling place, I would assume. Now these particular building projects in themselves would seem to be prudent and proper. But his next building project was fatal to the interests of the new nation called Israel. Jeroboam was jealous of Rehoboam and feared that the people might one day kill him and return to allegiance to Judah. He didn't trust the promise of God to him, given by the prophet a few chapters ago, uh, that if he would be faithful to his duty to God, that God would build a sure house for him too. He didn't serve the Lord. Instead of trusting God, Jeroboam, instead of obeying God's commands, Jeroboam devised an evil plan he thought was for his own safety. He would do all he could to prevent people from worshiping in the ways prescribed by God. Close the churches down. You can't sing. That's a bad idea. Jerusalem was the place that God had chosen for worship. Solomon's temple was there, and Jerusalem was where all Israel was commanded to keep the feasts, and this is where they were to bring their sacrifices. But after consulting with some of his politicians, he comes up with this wicked, wicked plan that he thought would resolve the problem. He set up two golden calves. Oh no, I thought we were done with the golden calves. No, but he brings them back. And he encourages his people to stay at home and worship at these altars. Stay home. You don't want to go down there to Jerusalem. It's too much trouble. You might catch something. Stay home. Turn that TV on. 
Just watch TV. Stay in your pajamas. Interesting to me that Jeroboam didn't have enough money to build a temple, a golden temple. <laughs> All he had was enough money for two golden calves. Kind of a cheapskate religion. But the people accepted his plan and they quickly turned from the worship of the one true God to worship the dumb idols. And this was a great sin against God and his word. And having set up these two idols, Jeroboam then went to establish his own clergy. And he got the clergy from the lowest classes of the people, which was also a great sin. And Jeroboam became infamous as being the one who caused Israel to sin by drawing them away from the worship of the one true God and turning them to wicked idolatry. Now, as we close uh, this chapter and close this message today, I always like to ask myself, what's the Holy Spirit telling me in all of this? You know, how does this apply to me? Well, there are three things that I can learn from this story. First of all, is that wisdom doesn't come by age. It doesn't come by what kind of education you have. It doesn't come from who your daddy was. Wisdom comes from the Lord. You need the Lord. In Daniel chapter two, Daniel said something. He said this, blessed be the name of God forever and ever for wisdom and might are his. And he changeth the times and the seasons. He removeth kings and setteth up kings. He giveth wisdom unto the wise and knowledge to them that have that no understanding. He revealeth the deep and secret things. He knoweth what is in the darkness and the light dwelleth with him. You want wisdom? You gotta get it from God. There's no other place to go. It comes from him. The second thing I think the Lord would speak to my heart and I think maybe speak to your heart is that even the best of people and governments cannot insulate themselves from criticism and reproach. Second Timothy 3.12 says, all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Don't be surprised when people uh, criticize you or reproach you for righteousness sake. You don't want to be criticized for evil sake. Shame on you if you're criticized for that. But when you're criticized for doing what's right, you're right in there with Churchill and Trump. <laughs> and the last thing is that those who put their trust in the advice of wicked fools they're marked for ruin. Proverbs 14, 16 says, one who is wise is cautious and turns away from evil, but a fool is reckless and careless. Well, I'll stop right there. And you say, well, this was a very political uh, uh, sermon this morning. Look. You preach it next time. <laughs> you preach 1 Kings chapter 12 and you tell me what you think about it. Because uh, history repeats itself, doesn't it? And uh, what we're seeing has been seen before. But it gives me some encouragement and the encouragement is this. Trust the Lord. Serve the Lord, and the kingdom of God is not hampered by any of the political things that are going on in this country. Jesus is Lord, and his kingdom is strong, and his people are going forward. And yea, though we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, we'll fear no evil. Why? Because he is with us. And if the Lord is with us, then uh, we don't need to fear anything that could come. Now, I do, I, I do... I mean, if I were in Israel at the time, I would want Rehoboam to be a little wiser than he was, wouldn't you? And uh, I, would, I would hope that um, somehow, some kind of wisdom would come through and prevail here, or not prevail, it has to appear on the scene. I haven't seen much wisdom at all. It just seems like such folly. Uh, but anyway, we can trust the Lord and, and uh, know that he does all things well. And... Uh, we're in his kingdom. So, Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word. And I thank you, Lord, that you have not left us alone in this world. 
You have given us your word, which is a light to our feet. It's a lamp. It helps us, Lord, to, to see in the darkness here. And Lord, these days are dark. We need your word, Lord. Thank you for it. And now, uh, Father, we also thank you that you've given us your Holy Spirit to lead us and guide us into all truth. And you've given us each other. And we thank you for that. Lord, I ask you to bless my friends here this morning and keep them. And Lord, help this nation. Help our leaders to reject the advice of foolish young hotheads. And Lord, may they, may the older, wiser, cooler heads prevail. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.